Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Josh, and thanks for tuning in. Welcome back to the Starboard Portal. We have an extra special session today for Cruising World readers and cruisers from around the country. Our panel of experts in safety, training, and navigation are here to provide tips and guidance for all your cruising adventures near and far. Thank you to our moderator, past, safety, uh, past U.S. Sailing Safety at Sea Chairman and nationally recognized boating safety expert Chuck Hawley, and our panelists Steve Colgate, Karen Prelo, and Bruce Brown for joining us today. And thank you to all our viewers for tuning in and those of you who watch this presentation uh, on playback some point later. And make sure to keep tuned in all the way through because at the end of the session, special for our viewers, we'll be announcing a special 30% discount offer for a digital copy of the book, Safety at Sea, A Guide to Safety Under Sail and Personal Survival, the companion book to our U.S. Sailing sa uh, Sanctioned Safety at Sea courses. And if you enjoyed today's session or any of the other sessions that we put on, Please support our efforts to build a community of active and engaged sailors through the Starboard Portal by purchasing or renewing U.S. Sailing Membership. We have some more great panels and sailing leadership forums coming up in the near future. And thanks to U.S. Sailing members who are able to adapt and evolve to better serve sailors with content like this. Visit us at mem.ussailing.org to join or renew your U.S. Sailing Membership today. Now, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to our moderator, Mr. Chuck Hawley. Chuck, take it away. Hey, thank you very much, Josh, and uh, welcome, everyone. You know, it's really exciting today. We have three true experts in the world of cruising and training. Uh, I don't think any of them would use the term about themselves as being experts, but in fact, it's true. Uh, yeah, Karen's already shaking her head no. Um, from the East Coast and from Fort Myers, we have uh, Steve Colgate, who's the chairman of the Offshore Sailing School and one of the most experienced and most influential trainers in the world of sailing. Uh, that uh, anybody could name. Uh, so we're delighted to have him. We also, from Newport Beach, uh, have Karen Prelo. Karen is a, a skipper and an instructor at the Professional Mariner School that's part of Orange Coast College's uh, School of Seamanship and, or Safety and Seamanship. And also from Southern California, we have Bruce Brown. Bruce Brown is a dear friend, longtime contributor to safety. He served in the past as a um, the president of the US, uh, USMSA, now I have to figure out what that is, US Marine Safety Association, uh, as well as being a safety at sea moderator uh, and uh, really wonderful to have him present. So what we're gonna do today is to go through three different sort of levels of cruising. Uh, we're gonna talk about coastal cruising, offshore cruising, and then passage making, each one getting a little bit more further away from help and further offshore. And we're gonna ask our panelists to identify a specific uh, topic within that, within tips for cruisers. So Steve, let's just start uh, with you. You and Doris uh, at the Offshore Sailing School have probably taught more would-be cruisers than perhaps anybody else in the country. Could you go through this, when we talk about coastal and offshore and passage making, could you give me a brief description of, of what, how you define that? Well, I think I, uh, coastal is uh, going from uh, harbor to harbor, uh, spending nights anchored or moored or docked uh, uh, for a, a period of time. Uh, then offshore passage making, we are going offshore is next. Uh, we get into uh, watch systems and safety problems and concerns about uh, weather and so on, uh, that would be my definition. Okay, and how about passage making? Where does that, how does, how does the, the increased demands of passage making make itself known? I'm, I'm sorry, you're breaking up. Uh, what was the question? Uh, passage making. How would you define passage making? Passage making? Well, passage making would be like 250 miles or further offshore uh, and, uh, and nonstop night and day for a long period of time just to get a, a, a you know, get from A to B, Great. But, uh, but in big mileage. So now let's go back to coastal and tell me what are some of the skills that you will be teaching your students for to in preparation for coastal cruising? What, what are some of the key skills that you will be talking about and what are the sort of courses that you're, you're well, I would offer? Coastal cruising is is uh, not uh, really out of sight of land. It's uh, 
just uh, going along. And so navigation is, is fairly easy. Um, and uh, I would say uh, certainly the safety programs, uh, things that uh, Bruce would come bring up. Uh, also, uh, I, I would be uh, concerned about uh, man overboard, uh, grills or crew overboard, uh, at least one way of getting back and practicing it um, and uh, and possibly later on and if you're doing uh, larger uh, you know, offshore passage making get into other ways of getting a crew back aboard okay great um, and I just wonder are the courses that you would offer for a coastal cruiser sufficient to allow somebody to charter someplace Yes, uh, basically there's three uh, levels in the beginning. Uh, there's basic keelboat, which really just gets you learning how to sail. Um, and then there's uh, basic cruising and bareboat cruising. We do all three levels uh, in a week long period. And at the end of a bareboat uh, cruising certification, uh, you, you're really capable of, of chartering a boat up to around 50 feet or so. Uh, in in uh, other areas, and of course, uh, you can take that certification and go back to U.S. Sailing, the National Governing Body of Sailing, and get uh, an IPC, an International Sailing Pro Proficiency uh, Certificate, and that would help you charter uh, as, or skipper uh, in Europe, uh, where they really require uh, either an International Proficiency Certificate or an ICC, International Certificate of, of, of C, International, ICC, International Certificate of Competency. You know, I ran into this uh, just a year or two ago. I can barely understand you. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Hey, uh, Karen, how am I coming through to you? You're good, okay. Um, sorry, Steve, uh, maybe you can adjust your volume up at your end. In any case, I ran into this need for a IC uh, International Certificate of Competency ICC or I IPC uh, when I, I had chartered in the Virgin Islands many, many times and had never been asked for any proof of my sailing ability other than filling out a form. But when I chartered in Croatia, it was required that I be able to provide this documentation. Is, has that been your experience? Uh, yes, that is our experience. Uh, actually, we have a lot of flotillas uh, going over uh, over there now, and uh, we have uh, Nate and Heather Atwater who run them for us. And I, in preparation for this, I called up Nate and said, "What what's your experience with the need for the IPC? So we'll take about five boats and we'll assign skippers, and each skipper has to have an IPC. So he said that what he's been doing is... Uh, getting the IPC copy of it, uh, sending it both to uh, the moorings, the charter agency, uh, and also the local charter uh, manager. And then uh, with, with that being done, he has never been asked for it. Well, probably better to be prepared than to be caught without it, I guess. Right. Hey, let me shift gears a little bit now and, and move over to Bruce. Bruce, your uh, expert, your expertise is frequently described as being how to use this uh, safety gear and um, training people in the use of it. But I notice that you always bring up the fact that you don't want to be too dependent on safety gear and rather make sure that people have adequate skills as well. So I just want to say that as a sort of as a disclaimer. Would you agree with that? Certainly, Chuck. I think there, you know, so often we're reliant on equipment rather than the skills to know how the equipment works or to be able to utilize gear that we have on board. Well, um, let's just go back to gear though, because that's the, the topic that I've kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, pinned with you. Um, and let's talk about what you think for coastal cruising. And, and as Steve said, that this is generally daytime cruising, maybe overnight, uh, shorter distances with a safe harbor within reasonable distances. Um, what sort of, what's sort of the critical gear that really makes a difference for sailors? So, of course, we have to start with the Coast Guard required equipment, which is 
life jackets for everybody on board, um, some type of, uh, of distress communication ability. So that's day signals or night signals. But I think really it's critically important that uh, boats that are doing coastal cruising have a way to communicate with search and rescue professionals. And that would be a VHF radio, could be handheld, uh, could be fixed mount. But I do think that a VHF radio is an important um, element. Um, there's nothing like being able to get on channel 16 and talk to the Coast Guard when there's a problem. So from the safety side, the wonderful thing about VHF radios is it's an open channel communication. Everybody with a radio can hear that signal. I think you do need to have a, a way to be able to get people back on board in case of a crew overboard. And that involves something like um, a life sling and, um, and practice so that you know how it works. Certainly a minimal first aid kit. And the most important element about a life jacket is have a life jacket that you'll actually wear. So a life jacket that's appropriate for the type of boating you're doing. Could be inflatable, could be inherently buoyant, um, but a life jacket you'll wear. And I think those are the elements that would be kind of the nucleus I would look for in a coastal uh, cruisers pack. Well, that's really good advice. Hey, you and I participated in 2005 in a symposium. In fact, I think Karen was there as well, where we threw uh, a number of volunteers in the water over and over again to try different uh, crew overboard techniques. C can you remember back then and tell me some of your takeaways on that? Because I, it seems to me that that was an enormously good learning experience for all of us. It was, and, and that... Um the documentation of that study is available on the U.S. Sailing Safety at Sea um, tab website. So that's a great resource to go back to. But the takeaways were, I think, that a lot of the skippers of the boats were trying to approach the victims either too fast or too close to the wind so that they had difficulty slowing the boats down. And in San Francisco Bay, of course, we had a fair amount of breeze. I think there were some certain challenges when we tried to do night rescues, particularly uh, learning about how disorienting strobe lights were um, for the victims that were in the water, and that just returning to the victim wasn't a solution to crew overboard rescue. You had to be able to take the step to be able to actually rescue the victim by lifting them out of the water. And so you had to have a plan, and you had to have the gear, and then you had to be able to execute the plan. Great. Yeah, those were uh, really good points. One of the things that I remember, too, was that some of our students who were practicing or some of our volunteers who were practicing would sort of race past a dummy in the water and snag it and flick it on deck and say, you know, oh, hey, three and a half minutes, when in fact, it's a lot more difficult to get that person back on deck and stand alongside them and so forth and not injure them. Well, this is a good... It's a good segue to, to reintroduce Karen Prelo. Karen is an instructor at the Professional Mariner uh, School at the Orange Coast College School of Safety and Seamanship. And she uh, served as one of the captains of Alaskan Eagle over many, many years and taught literally thousands of students how to go cruising, uh, sailing all over the uh, Eastern and Western Pacific. So welcome, Karen. Thanks, Jack. Glad to be here. Um, and you're going to be talking about specific skills that people ought to um, know, as, and especially related to navigation. So let's once again, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about uh, coastal cruising. And of course, you're in one of the busiest shipping areas in the country, if not the world. And you're in an area that has a heck of a lot of fog, especially in the summer months. So you've really got it all. Uh, when you teach students how to go out across to uh, Catalina or one of the Channel Islands, they are in a tough environment. So it's great that you started with that because on my sheet, my cheat sheet in front of me, I have weather. So before you even go anywhere, before you think about navigation or any of those sorts of things, you have to look at the weather. And in fact, this morning it was socked in fog. So it's funny that you brought fog into it. Uh, weather's important just for any sailor. And these are things that you build on, whether you're going coastal or near coastal, offshore, inland, it doesn't matter. One of the first things and most important things is weather. You know, how hot, how cold, 
Are you going to have a heat stroke? Are you going to have hypothermia? Are you just going to be comfortable? Because when you're not comfortable, you don't do something else that's super important, and that is keeping a strong watch. So when we talk about navigation, one of the most important things is that you keep a watch. And so uh, looking back at navigation, saying what kind of skills do you need? Well, now we've looked at the weather. Where are we going to go? And when we talk about coastal or areas that are close to us that we can see by line of sight, then maybe we're familiar with them from the land, but we're not familiar with them from the sea. So it's important to just have basic understanding of charts because what you're looking at on the water may actually be very shallow underneath it. Uh, there are other things that tie into it too, tides and tidal currents, depending on where you are. But when we go back to the very, very basics is just understanding what the area looks like above the water and below the water. I am... Um, have a real thing about navigation and that I think it needs to be integrated. And I like the word integrated because we talk about traditional navigation, which is plotting and paper charts and things like that. And then we talk about electric navigation, e-navigation. But realistically, you need to go all the way back to where the Polynesians and the others were, where you use your senses. And a funny example of that would be being off the fog here. If it was suddenly socked in fog, well, you know by the smell of French fries that you're close to the end of the pier. So, you know, you think about your sight, your sound, uh, the smell, you know, even the feel, the way the water and the waves um, rock back when you're getting close to certain areas. Those senses are super important as well. So I would say um, when we talk about navigation, think about your senses. Think about the general area of the chart, what's above and under the water. And then um, basing on that, you can figure out some other things like time, speed, distance. I want to go 10 miles. My boat goes four knots. How long is that going to take me? Is that, a good, is that a good idea for a day trip? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe I'm going to 10, 10 nautical miles away and I have to turn around and come back. Well, that's a 20 mile trip. So um, time, speed, and distance, how long is it going to take? How far are you going to go? And um, then the last thing I have just for the coastal, the immediate, the bottom level is understanding how to steer, just how to steer your boat in general, how to steer a compass course. If you're electronics, if you're using electronics, that's great. But what are your backups? How do you steer with the electronics? How do you steer with your compass? So I would say that those are kind of the ground floor things. Then we'll build on them later. Hey, that's terrific. I, I have a question for you. Uh, uh, several years ago, I did a, a winter passage from Oceanside, which is just to the south of where you're located, up to Santa Cruz, where I'm located. And so this is about a, I don't know, 250 or 270 mile trip. Um, this was on, we double handed a boat largely under power, although it was a 40 foot sailboat. And during that time, even though I know that we had paper charts on board, we relied virtually 100% on our senses and a big Garmin GPS. So should I feel guilty about that or, or is that okay? Uh, honestly, it's okay. However, just like people used to say, oh, paper charts are the be all end all, oops. I spilled my coffee on it. Oops, right. it went overboard. Oh shoot, it's got a fold in it. I didn't see that rock we just hit. So there is no one medium that's perfect. And I'll talk a little more about that later, but you should feel guilty, but you should have the backups. And I'll talk about backups when we talk about electronics further on as well. So no, don't feel guilty. I'll just say one more thing about that. Those of us who grew up sailing, prior to GPS, we're sort of forced into this, right? And, and, and it's so it becomes more optional to a newer sailor or power boater who comes into it, who realizes that why would I ever learn the basics when I can simply look at my tablet or my phone or my you know, fixed display? I promise uh, you, Chuck, I'll cover that. Okay, <laughs> okay, excellent. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to check back in with the Colgates to see if they're uh, on the air. Steve, how are you doing? Steve, can you hear me now? Hey, Steve, could you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me?
Steve? Okay. Yes. Oh, there you are. Um, okay. Let's now talk about the next level up of uh, experience or competency, and that would be um, offshore sailing. Can you tell me about the sort of courses that you have at Offshore Sailing School uh, that give somebody additional skills to go further offshore? Uh, I would say that would be the uh, bare boat uh, charter area uh, that, uh, uh, again, we are not traveling at night because most bare boat chartering companies will not allow you to sail at night. So uh, we don't get into the night sailing, but uh, we get into every other aspect of it. Some of the things that Karen and Bruce were talking about. What happens if you have a personal boat and you want to actually extend beyond this kind of coastal harbor hopping world and sail on multiple day passages? What, what sort of courses would you offer for them? In, in other words, above and beyond uh, the level of chartering. Well, that would be probably be the, the uh, I'm sorry I've had trouble with the hearing and you're breaking up again, but you're looking at uh, a, uh, a course, a course that would be available for somebody who's doing uh, almost passage making. Okay. Overnight. Yes. Now, we do offshore. We do, we do coastal passage making on that level. And coastal passage making is, uh, does have some night sailing and, uh, and get people familiar with night sailing, night, night of crew overboard situations and stuff like that. What, what's different or, or what do you emphasize for uh, your students when they do start sailing in pitch darkness of night away from the lights of shore? What, what are the, how do you get them? To well, them? Obviously a lookout, obviously a lookout. You always have to have somebody on the lookout. Uh, I, I would say one thing that people don't make enough use of at night is binoculars. Uh, it's amazing how just you see some lights and you put on some binoculars or use some binoculars and you can really tell what those lights are which way they're going and, and so on. Obviously, uh, they have to know the various lights, uh, you know, the running lights and uh, the right of way rules from the point of view of the running running lights. But I, I remember in Long Island Sound one time uh, not being able to figure out a whole bunch of lights and I got some binoculars and boy, it just made like, like daytime. It was really makes all the difference in the world. But uh, I would say that uh, watch systems are necessary. Uh, when you get to that situation, you don't want to get any one person too tired. And there are various watch systems that, uh, that work uh, uh, depending on how long your passage is going to be, how many days it's going to be. You know. How about self-sufficiency? What are some of the skills that you would expect somebody to have so that they can fix their vessel or they can deal with uh, sort of uh, minor failures that might occur? Well, I think that, uh, you know, actually one of the, one of the things that you really need to have someone uh, learn very well is steering the compass course. And uh, I'm not going to, you know, I, I don't know how to swing a compass uh, and I'm not going to get, we're not teaching how to swing a compass but you do need to have a, a compass that, that works. And it's amazing how, uh, you know, how, how much navigation you can do with just a compass and, and a uh, pedometer and the knowledge of, of how, how fast you're going and how long you're going. So. Great. Okay. Right, so Bruce, let's now give us your short, sort of short list of items that you would add to your coastal gear uh, that would include things for uh, multiple day passages, uh, which we're going to define as offshore. Sure. Thanks, Chuck. So I think we start with the communications and we go from a handheld VHF to ensuring that we have a fixed mount VHF uh, with an antenna that's mounted higher, uh, particularly 
for offshore. I'm a big believer in um, VHF radios with digital selective calling, which allow for a very quick and easy distress call to go out to any vessel that has um, um, a VHF radio on. I think at this stage, we start looking at ways to communicate um, um, trouble or uh, that there's an emergency that starts with uh, the VHF radio. Um, a personal locator beacon, which is a small version of an EPIRB, um, sends a signal anywhere in the world that will be picked up uh, by a satellite and um, then related to a ground station. The, uh, the big brother of that is a EPIRB that uh, has longer duration, floats in the operating position and has a strobe light. The personal locator beacon does not float in the operating position, so it has to be held. The antenna has to be oriented in the right place. Um, and you have to be sure that you're not covering up the um, internal GPS antenna if the unit has a GPS. So these devices become um, kind of critically important for communicating that there is a distress. And these days, search and rescue professionals can tell who you are, if you've registered the beacon, which costs you nothing, where you are um, in an extremely um, quick period of time. I think you want to add a radar reflector or an AIS or and an AIS. Radar certainly becomes um, a tremendous um, tool as well. Um, so you want to be able to be seen. You want to be able to communicate with other vessels. AIS allows other vessels to see you and you to see other vessels um, that may be out of sight. It's VHF based. I think you upgrade that uh, life jacket that anybody will wear to a 33 pound, probably inflatable life jacket with a harness, a tether, um, jack lines to be able to attach yourself to the boat. Um, uh, you should have a light fixed to the, um, to the life jacket so that you can signal. And now you start talking about having a first aid kit that would allow you to um, hopefully um, deal with any medical emergencies that might last a week. Uh, so you start looking at building on your initial kits, your initial equipment by extension, but again, still any gear that you buy, you have to ensure that it's maintained and serviced, that it's registered, it operates as you expect it will, so you test it and you're comfortable and familiar with it and others on board are as well. That's a really good list, uh, and I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I know that you um, have investigated a number of accidents both on both the uh, California coast, but you also have read the accident reports that U.S. Sailing has written over the last couple of years. And in several instances, something that's like a personal locator beacon, but isn't a personal locator beacon called a SEND device, like the SPOT or the INREACH, has actually been helpful in those accidents. So why wouldn't you just say, just get one of those? Well, these are tremendous devices for tracking. Um, they actually can, through a second agency, communicate to search and rescue professionals, but it's not a direct link to search and rescue professionals. So those send devices are dependent on another agency being the communication with um, the search and rescue professionals and the EPIRB, um, while it does not accommodate two-way communication, it certainly does communicate directly with the search and rescue professionals, thus speeding up the process of launching um, potential help. And if I can just make one quick statement, you know, we've always talked about VHF radio being line of sight in this last year and last summer in Transpac, um, we were uh, a couple hundred miles offshore and heard a distress call. We responded to the distress call um, thinking we may be acting as a radio relay and coming in loud and clear was um, U.S. Coast Guard sector LA Long Beach as if they were right next to us. And it took me quite a while to figure out that they were actually bouncing off of one of the AWACS planes um, that was up in the air. So quite a surprise to get a VHF call from the U.S. Coast Guard a couple hundred miles offshore. Great. And one more quick question. You mentioned uh, the initials AIS 
And I think most people know or have read about AIS, but just give me a, a little bit more information. What does it stand for and what does it do? Sure. So it's an automatic information system. It's VHF based. It, it's like an airplane squawk system. So it sends a signal uh, from its transmitter uh, to other vessels, to land based stations. Other vessels send signals that it can receive and uh, land based stations can send and receive signals. So AIS is tremendously helpful in congested areas. Um, when I've been doing deliveries um, up the Mexican coast, we communicate quite often with um, commercial vessels that are on um, converging courses with us to ensure that there's a clear protocol for how we're going to pass each other. Uh, so it's a tremendous way to be able to communicate with other vessels because you have all of their call sign information uh, and their MMSI numbers. Uh, great, okay. I, I will tell you on the same winter passage uh, it was fascinating to see the locations of all of the commercial ships that were on the northbound separation scheme uh, heading up past uh, the Channel Islands off of Santa Barbara. And, you know, we knew so much about them without actually having to communicate with them. You know, it, it was just sort of free information we could, we could download. So, Karen, let's go back to, uh, to you now and talk more about the skills that you think as you go into multiple day passages what are some of the skills and the navigational techniques or the navigational knowledge that you'd use? Right, well, we would um, build, of course, on our integration of the electronic and the traditional and the senses and those sorts of things. And we would do that by different ways. And I'd like to add in a depth sounder at this point is really important. So a fathometer, a depth sounder is something that you really want to keep an eye on. Um, one of the things that uh, we really emphasize is a backup for your GPS systems, because like you said, Chuck, you know, we all, we all use GPS uh, chart-based plotters and nav tools like that now because they are so simple. But I want to show you just a couple of things that I think will be interesting. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, Chuck, you'll have to let me know. The first screen just says, I want you to look at the weather. Do you see that, Chuck? Yes, check the weather. Chuck. Okay, check the weather. Now, this picture was actually taken in our harbor earlier this year, and you can see that um, based on the color, the, the gains up on it, but you can see that there is a lot of stuff out there, and you could not see 10 feet in front of the vessel. So utilizing um, radar is a really good thing, but of course, checking the weather before you go is super useful. Um, when we talk about our GPS and other uh, hang on a second, let me get this in slideshow. There we go. When we look at GPS, um, Chuck, can you see that? Is there anything covering it or can you see my slide that says technology isn't always right? No, it looks fantastic. It looks like you were standing on a small island in a <laughs> cove. So for those of you that know Catalina, that is Cabrillo. There's a very large rock there that you used to be able to tie onto. It had a cleat and then it had a re piece of rebar on it. You could tie your stern line to. Um, obviously, that's not where we were. So if we were in the preceding picture, dense, dense fog, and expecting perhaps to come into the Newport Chetties, we might miss, or, or, or we might not. We might hit it spot on. So this is something that was just taken off a new, um, This I won't say which technology it was, but this is a download of a very well-known version of a navigation short plotter. The next picture shows you that charts are often wrong, and that means any sort of chart. Now this is, it doesn't matter if it's electronic, it could be a paper chart. And the reason that charts are wrong is for different reasons, but this was in the Exumas. Uh, and if you remember that in the Exumas and that whole area actually of even the East Coast in 2017, um, there are hurricanes and things that will cause something that looks like this. So what you're looking at there is a chart and the depths on that chart um, where we suddenly made a right-hand turn uh, are anywhere between 16 and 19 feet. And one of the things we did, this was just on a, on a charter. We always uh, check the route, whether it's a paper chart or a plain chart, it doesn't matter. We always check the route. And so this route um, had been 
uh, quantified. We were sure that we had plenty of water below us. And in fact, looking at the depth sounder, uh, all of a sudden I was like, hey, it's six feet. Let's get to deeper water. So charts are, are wrong and they're often wrong. And that's why you need to pay close attention. Uh, one of the things that we have is a local notice to mariners or a notice to mariners. So it's really smart to look at that. At one point, the East Coast, and I'm sure Steve could elaborate on this, um, but after the East Coast had been pummeled by various and sundry hurricanes, they had over 600 buoys off station. That's a whole lot of buoys to be off station. Uh, trying to, sorry, I'm having a little technical glitch here, trying to stop sharing my screen, so bear with me, please. Um, Zoom has covered up my, there we go. Zoom had covered up all my controls. Uh, so I, I think that's something really important to keep in, in the back of your mind. Uh, all charts can be incorrect and you just have to pay ultra attention to you know, your surroundings. Um, along with that, I'd like you to think about, uh, Steve said compass, how to steer a compass course. So sometimes the electronics go down. And in fact, um, electronics, don't always go down, but they sometimes give you a false sense of security. If I asked everybody in the audience to turn on their iPhone or smart device and put it onto the compass, I can guarantee you that many of those compasses will be incorrect. And I'm lucky because I have a bunch of college students that I can do all these great crazy things with. And so I actually sent um, a bunch of college students on a little game. And the game was, uh, that they had to hide somewhere on campus and give latitude and longitude. And the other students that were in the classroom had to go find them and they had to use their compasses to go find them. And I had two students that were using the exact same program. And one compass said North and the other compass said South. The other thing we found is that using uh, phone compasses at night when it's hard to see, you could be traveling along and be off course, but the compass has to be reset. So you have to turn it, reset it, recalibrate it. Now these things are getting better and better, but I just want to warn you that they're not perfect. So now we go back to, um, to what Steve said about learning how to steer just a magnetic compass. Well, one of the fun things about magnetic compasses is that they are magnetic. And so they pull, of course, to magnetic north. You all know that. But what you might not think about is the fact that you put your phone right next to it or your iPad right next to it. So you have this lovely smart device that has magnetic speakers in it. But now your compass is not steering a correct course. So there's all sorts of fun little things like that to think about. Uh, one of my favorite instructor assessment stories was from a friend of mine who was being assessed and he had the binoculars up and he said, the course is X or the bearing is X. And the assessor said, you're wrong. It's Y. No, it's X. No, it's Y. Well, what happened was one of them was wearing a pair of glasses and the metal in the glasses screwed up the compass in the binoculars. So one of the things you want to think about is your basic thing, which is such a basic piece, a great tool is your compass. Make sure you protect it. Um, I could go on and on. So I'm just going to use one more thing and then I'll bring it back to you, Chuck. And that is a log. You really do need to keep a log. So these smart devices go down. Uh, you could have bad batteries. You have another one in your pocket and you pull it out and you discover that the free app you used as a backup that you downloaded on your iPhone, uh, unfortunately is full of ads and it's unusable. These are all things that you know my students have done. So check your backups, but beyond all that, go back to the most simplistic thing of all and keep a log. So what's the time? What distance have you run? What course are you going? All right, now back to you, Chuck. Great, thanks. Uh, really great pointers. I have to add one tiny C story a friend of mine was sailing in the 1981 Transpac on some IOR boat and was barreling along at night. And every time he would come on deck, he found that the sails were uh, hor horrifically trimmed and they were all strapped in and he couldn't understand this. So he and his crew, he and his watch would go and ease the sheets and they'd bear off and they'd get on course. And 
Then they'd come on another six hours later and they'd find that the seats, sheets were all strapped in. And it turns out that they one team was adding variation and one team was subtracting variation. And so they had about a 30 degree swing in the courses that they were steering. So anyway, it can happen to anyone. Hey, back to you, Steve. Let, now let's go to the, the long, long distances for, in your case, um, it may be uh, sailing across the uh, Gulf of Mexico or possibly on the other coast, it would be sailing to Bermuda or down into the um, British Virgin Islands, say. What, what additional, are there courses that you can take that would help with that? And what additional knowledge would you recommend that people have if they're going essentially internationally on their sailboats? Well, I think they, uh, there are a lot of uh, groups that sail together. And uh, what's it, Steve Black is his name? Did a whole bunch sure. of, the, yeah, the uh, Car Caribbean 1500s, whatever, where, where a bunch of sailboats sail uh, sort of as a flotilla together and they have contact with each other in the VHF and if one person has some trouble, some engine problem, problems or whatever, they can uh, uh, ask others for advice and get it, get it done, uh, get, it, get help. Uh, medical, the same way. I know we, we were, I was on a Bermuda race one time and uh, one of our, our the, the owner's son got appendicitis and we were able to contact other, uh, uh, other boats in, in a race that had doctors on them and they, confirmed our, our, uh, our, our, our view that it was appendicitis. And uh, we were able to transfer him to another boat that dropped out of the race and had, had go, could uh, get to Bermuda faster under power than we could possibly get there. And so he was saved. So the, the, the thing is to be able to work out with other other boats that uh, that can help uh, and sail that way. Um, sailing alone, uh, I don't know what you'd want to have. I guess we talked to Bruce about the type of uh, uh, equipment that you'd want to have to uh, if you're sailing alone for for long distances. Um, I can't think of. Uh, what we're doing. Well, Steve, you bring up a good point, which is uh, sailing in a fleet of boats is one way to do it. The other thing is to just sail with better sailors and to mm -hmm. have them, you know, as you get a thousand miles or something with somebody that's pretty darned adept going to Bermuda or going across on a Pacific Cup or Transpac on the West Coast. I mean, you can learn an enormous amount by just sailing with better people and then applying that to your own vessel. Or would you agree with that? Uh, oh, sure. I'd certainly agree with that. Uh, one of the, one of the interesting things that uh, the owner of the boat uh, with the appendicitis was a mountain climber uh, named Larry Huntington, and uh, he uh, had a book aboard called uh, Medicine for Mountaineers, and uh, I'd swear by that book, you know, because mountaineers are the same things. You're out. You're out. Uh, uh, possibly three weeks at a time without any possibility of getting a helicopter or getting, uh, uh, getting, getting to a hospital. Uh, and you have to be able to subside, to take care of whatever happens. And that medicine for mountaineering was a, just a wonderful book for that. That's what we used to, to find out whether this was appendicitis or not. Uh, you bring up a really good point, which is that, um, I know that Bruce has had this experience. When we need a doctor for a uh, safety at sea course, we inevitably find somebody who either has an emergency room experience, an ER doc or an ER uh, nurse, or somebody with Wilderness Medical Society experience, because they're used to dealing, you know, making splints out of tree branches and doing things that with whatever they've got on board. I, I will say one thing, Steve, when you started telling me about the appendicitis, I was convinced that you elected to take it out on your own. And I was just hoping that wasn't the end of the story. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, anything else you uh, want to add about uh, longer distance uh, uh, training and longer distance preparation? Well, I, you know, I did mention watch systems and, and of course, short 
distance racing or, or tra- uh, cruising, uh, you know, four on, four off is a decent watch system. Uh, but it means that you're going to have the same length of time during the daytime that you have at night. Uh, and also it is an even number of watches at four into 24 or six. And so you have an even number of watches. So you really want an odd number of watches because uh, with an even number, you're, if you have the midnight to 4 a.m. watch, which isn't the best one to have, uh, it, uh, you'll get that every night because with an even number of watches. But if you have an odd number, then it changes and you get a different. Uh, and we we tried a whole bunch of watches. I sort of liked 44565, which is midnight to 4 a.m., 4 to, uh, to 8 a.m., which hits breakfast time. Then 5 to 1 p.m., uh, which hits lunchtime, and then 6 uh, to 7 p.m., which hits your normal, you know, quite often normal dinner time, and then 5 to midnight. And so you have the shorter ones at night, and you have nice longer ones during the day. You can get a good night, a good day sleep. <laughs> and uh, so that uh, that's just a, a possible thought if you're going to be going for about two or three weeks at a time. Great, great advice. Um, okay, back to you, Bruce. Uh, now, now we're going to uh, Hawaii or we're going to Bermuda or possibly sailing across uh, the Atlantic to uh, British Isles. Uh, what additional pieces of gear? You've got a pretty well-equipped boat at this point, but what additional pieces of gear would you consider for transoceanic sailing? So I now start talking about, um, this is where we put a life raft on board where um, self-sufficiency may be required in case you lose the vessel um, for communication, either a single sideband or a satellite phone. And if you you are gonna choose to use a satellite phone, please be sure that you program the phone numbers in that you may need so that you're not having to call somebody you know to have them look up a phone number so you can communicate with them. Uh, You wanna upgrade that first aid kit now to uh, perhaps have uh, full meds, uh, because again, you're really talking about self-sufficiency. Damage control needs to be um, uh, something to consider. So you wanna be sure you can control water coming into the boat um, before you ever consider dewatering a boat. And now you probably are talking about upgrading signals uh, so that we start looking at perhaps um, the commercial uh, flares as a signaling device Um, but ways you can communicate distress. So you want to be trying to protect yourself with self-sufficient so you can maintain ways to stay out of the water um, and keep water out of the boat. And you want to ensure that you have a way to keep everybody on board um, as safe, as warm, and as dry as possible, and then communicate if there's any sense of distress. So kind of working up the chart, that's VHF, VHF with digital selective calling, I would prefer to have all of the VHFs be DSC VHFs, and then EPIRBs and uh, perhaps satellite phone or single sideband for communication. You know, I I wanted to um, get back to life rafts for a moment. In the classes that, or the courses that you've run, primarily in Southern California, but really across the country, um, one of, on the second day, people are forced or or elect to, to have to board a life raft from the water wearing foul weather gear and boots and a life jacket. What, what sort of takeaways have you had from the students in your class who have had to do that? Well, um, I actually had the um, owner and skipper of a large racing yacht sit me down afterwards and say, so the one takeaway for him was he said, he really believes he needs to put a bunch more 20 year olds on board to help drag his butt into the life raft. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a challenge. And uh, two things I think are the takeaway. One, it's a challenge, but the big takeaway is that it can be done. And there are techniques to board a life raft, even to bring someone who's injured into a life raft. So the raft always looks bigger from the water looking up at it than it seems to look at look when you're standing at a boat show looking down at it. So life rafts are an important element for passage making but I believe I would probably want to have an EPIRB before I put a life raft on a boat. Uh, so is this another area where 
uh, Coast Guard certification means that it's necessarily a better product. Saying that a different way, if you were going across the ocean, would you get a, Coast, a US Coast Guard approved raft? I'm not sure if you've locked up or if I didn't say that correctly. Bruce, are you there? Yeah, so no, I would not. And the reason vessels, um, a recreational marine life raft might weigh um, 60, 70, 80 pounds for a six person raft. The same um, capacity life raft in a commercial raft would weigh 140, 150 pounds because there's redundant equipment. They're designed to meet all weather conditions. So they have insulated canopies. They have more gear packed in them, things that can't be shrunk. So the containers get larger. Coast Guard approved life rafts belong on commercial vessels. Recreational marine life rafts belong on recreational vessels. Understood, great. Um, hey, Karen, since you were our um, talent for the life jacket, or pardon me, for the life raft uh, video that we did uh, last summer or summer before last, it's hard to know with COVID. Um, what were some of your takeaways from having to board a life raft from the water wearing your gear? Well, I've been lucky enough to not have to do it for real, but I've done it, in fact, several times just as a demo and so forth. And it's always hard. It's, um, it's so easy in a pool. You get a little bit of slosh and roll from a bay even, and it makes it harder. It's always hard when you have gear on, and especially if you have water in your shoes or something that's dragging you down. You know, your clothing when you're in the water can be a great warmth. Um, it, it can help you stay warm. But then as you get out of the water and it's full of water and weight, it makes it a lot harder. The other thing that makes it really hard is the type of tight jacket you have on. So if you have a really large inflatable life jacket that sticks out like this, trying to get up and over, it can be difficult. Understood. Um, you know, I have a question from one of our um, participants uh, and this gets back to navigation for just a moment. This person says, if you're, if you're planning a long leg of a trip and, and just for, uh, because we're Californians, the three of us, um, if, let's say that you're going on a long on a long leg up the coast of California. Do you simply put in the starting and ending points and look at the overview, or do you have to sort of wander along the course to see what hazards might lurk? Uh, I saw that question. It's a great question, and it's one that I I didn't um, clarify what I stated before. So I, I always qualify a route. What does that mean? That means that you look all, all along the route to see whether it's on a paper chart or whether you're using a um, electronic chart or some, some sort of chart plotter where you're putting in waypoints. You always want to look all across that route for depths, uh, for bits of land, for rocks, for anything that might be in the way. So absolutely should be zooming in, zooming out if you're on electronics. Same goes for radar, by the way, zoom in, zoom out. Um, but that's called qualifying the route. So 100%, yes. Good question. Uh, you know, in the I was on the panel that looked into the grounding of Vestas wind uh, several years ago in the Bulbo Ocean race. Uh, and what was obvious to us uh, and admitted by the crew is that they were using a zoomed out view of the Indian Ocean off of the uh, Eastern shore of Africa and they were zoomed out so far that a, a shoal, which measured 35 miles from one tip to the other tip, did not show up as land. And they ran into it going 21 knots and lost, well, they didn't lose the boat. They grounded the boat, the boat was later salvaged. But uh, really, <laughs> really good example of wanting to either use paper charts of the proper scale or to walk your way along at a zoomed in view so that all chart objects are visible. Is that, I, I assume you'd agree with that? A hundred percent, hundred thousand percent, yes. Okay, Okay. and again, finally back to you for, for these long distance passages, uh, you're, you're on a coast where people are frequently sailing to Hawaii, which is you know, 2,250 miles away uh, with no intermediate ports. Um, what are some of the skills that you want people to have and some of the navigational gear in those instances? All right, so I would start again with weather and I would plan 
first thing you do before you pull, uh, decide to do something like that is you should put together a passage plan. So you need to know what time of year are you going to go. And there's some wonderful resources. There are pilot charts, there's world cruising routes, there's things like that to look at. So time of year, which is where the weather obviously fits in. Uh, beyond that, you're going to look at other things. So you're gonna see which charts you need so what electronic and backup charts you should have. And boats do get hit by lightning, things happen. Um, it doesn't mean that it's the end of your voyage by any means. And in fact, those have become our primary means of navigation. But you should have some rudimentary celestial skills, just rudimentary. And remember, it's um, just a matter of math. The lovely sexton is just a small part of it. That's measuring the angle. It shouldn't be intimidating to you. And I know more than one couple who taught themselves celestial when we first went cruising and met them in the South Pacific. They taught themselves celestial along the way. Now, this was a long time ago and they did not have a GPS and they did not have the whiz bang sat nav. So it can be done. Um, so we're looking at weather, we're looking at some basic nav skills to back up. You're definitely keeping a log. You wanna look at notice to mariners. So is the place you're going still closed for COVID? Has there been some sort of activity there that's less than friendly? Uh, are um, navigational aids off station? Has there been a difference in the shoaling of an area? So there's something called a notice to mariners that you should look at. And then there's some other funny things that you might not think about, and that is holidays. So you have this long, arduous trip and you arrive and you've arrived on a Sunday and you can't check in, or you've arrived on the beginning of Easter celebrations and you can't check in. So there's funny things like that that you just wanna take an eye up to. As far as skills, um, I did say basic celestial, but the other thing I would suggest is that you have some other way of steering than autopilot. And I would also recommend that you take your boat off autopilot and know how to steer it well in awful conditions. So practice steering. And then we had an autopilot failure from, oh, let's see, I think it was in Tonga. It might've been in Tahiti, it doesn't really matter. But we definitely sailed from Tonga to New Zealand, stopping at the Minerva Reef, using a sheet to tiller system. So there's sheet to tiller, you can rig um, other ways with a wheel and stuff, but those are just kind of basic skills that are good to have. Uh, really good advice. And certainly as you are sailing shorter and shorter handed down to single handed, uh, a steering device failure can make a miserable uh, situation for you. Um, I, I won't, tell the whole story, but I ended up dropping my tiller master into the Pacific about a thousand miles offshore. And luckily I was sailing very close to someone and they picked it up out of the water and handed it back to me. Um, and uh, in doing so, uh, basically saved my life because otherwise I would have to have been hand steering for a thousand miles in a 24 foot boat. Um, long story, as I said. Hey, Bruce, I have a question from you from one of our uh, participants. Uh, and it's actually a statement and I want you to comment on it. Um, this person said that after going through the, the uh, in the water session with the life raft, he committed to getting a life raft, but it had to have a boarding platform on it. Tell us what a boarding platform is. Sure, so modern life rafts are designed with either a rigid, semi-rigid or inflatable uh, platform that is designed to assist getting aboard the life raft, the ladder for the life raft is um, generally a webbing ladder and it's attached under the raft. So basically when you put your foot against the ladder, it wants to swing under the raft. And the technique to board the raft is to do whatever you can to get a knee up on that boarding platform using your legs to push on the ladder. Once you, knee, you get one knee up on the boarding platform, then getting into the raft becomes much easier. Uh, tremendous. Yeah, and different uh, manufacturers interpret this differently, but basically anything is better than just relying on a webbing ladder. Correct. Um, uh, Karen, when you were doing the uh, demonstration for the video, 
I think you had you were had a Switlick. Uh, is it OPR? Is that the raft? How yes. how hard was it for you to get aboard the um, that particular raft? It was probably medium hard. Medium hard. Okay. I've been on some that are faster and easier, and some that are harder. It's probably medium. And this is one of the reasons I don't want to uh, get too off topic here, but it's one of the reasons to have a raft commander meaning someone who's not seasick and who's fairly physically able to help people board, um, especially if they have to board from the water, which is the worst way to do it. You wanna board from a vessel that's about to sink without dragging all that water in with you. Um, okay, any wrap up points? We've lost Steve, unfortunately, um, but um, does anybody, <laughs> either of our panelists wanna have any concluding statement? How about you, Karen? Do you have a concluding statement? Well, it's not necessarily a concluding statement, but I realized I forgot to bring up weather routing and the ability to read weather. So there are some fabulous weather routers that do a great job, but in addition to it, just being able to download and analyze weather is a really good idea if you're going on a long offshore passage. I just wanted to add that. So it used to be that virtually all offshore boats had a weather fax that was a dedicated piece of gear um, now, what do you find more modern boats in the uh, in this millennium are using? They're downloading it using sat satellite navigation, uh, sat phones and things like that. And you can get amazing weather uh, information that way. You can still get weather faxes, you can get grip files, you can do all sorts of great, great and crazy things. And the other thing that's really exciting is that there have been some phenomenal weather satellites that have been shot up into the air. Uh, in fact, I think one was last October and it's really helping. We still, on the Pacific especially, don't get the best weather reporting, but these sorts of tools that are winding up in the sky are really useful and helpful. Uh, great advice. Bruce, any uh, wrap up comments from your end? Sure, thanks Chuck. So I think the way I try to look at safety for cruising is recognizing what tools you have on board and like a craftsman, you have to be able to use the tools to their fullest capacity. So just buying more equipment isn't the solution. If you don't know how the stuff works, all you've done is lower your waterline and lighten your pocketbook. So let's do everything we can to um, continue enjoying our sport safely and, uh, and get out on the water. Terrific. And, and uh, I do have one more uh, comment for you, Bruce, that there's apparently been a number of incidents off the coast of Spain in which orcas have attacked sailboats. And this, uh, we know of course about a whale attack coming back from the Pacific Cup, I think, right? Nick Barron's was, experience. Correct, yes it was. Have you heard anything about orcas attacking sailboats off of Spain or is my leg being pulled? No, it's been covered pretty pretty wildly, uh, widely. Um, but, but I think, you know, as um, with COVID and the, uh, declining number of commercial vessels that were plying through the water and a declining number of recreational vessels. I think it's opened up um, the sea traffic to a lot more activity, perhaps in areas that uh, whales were avoiding in the past. Very good. Oh, and I, I'll say just to be even scarier, we're getting a lot more shark uh, action off of the uh, California California coast, which is a little terrifying, especially since we're in the world of great white sharks. Um, hey, Bruce, I have, or, or Karen, I'm gonna start with you and we're gonna wrap this up, but we never really got around to how you got started in cruising. Um, I, I know you're a professional mariner and you've you know sailed all over the world, but tell me how, what was sort of the genesis of how you got started? When I was 15 years old, my best friend's dad dragged me to a schooner association, association meeting. And a man named Ernie Minnie, some of you may know Minnie Surplus, uh, showed a eight millimeter film of Kelpie Goes to Tahiti. And from that moment, I had decided I was going to sail to Tahiti. And eventually I did. And my son was born there and I continued on and kept going. Great, terrific. Um, how about you, Bruce? What, what got you started in cruising? Uh, so when I was 16, I was uh, able to be in Hawaii where my uncle had sponsored one of the boats that finished. Um, and she was, uh, while a group of avid racers, she was um, a beautifully outfitted traditional cruising boat. 
And uh, when they talked about the passage back, I thought, I need to sign up for this. It took me a while to learn that uh, every island or every place you go is not necessarily a mark of the course for racing. So um, you can actually stop and enjoy yourself. And it's uh, made a huge difference for me around the world. Terrific. Well, I, in, in my case, I, uh, my parents had a H30 Hershoff uh, catch when I was in high school. And I asked if I could sail it down to Southern California for my high school graduation. So I picked up four other kids from my graduating class and we sailed down to uh, Marina del Rey. It was terrific and sailed most of the way back. So, hey, I, th I think that does it at our end. Josh, do you, are you online? Would you like to wrap this up? Yes, thank you guys. This was uh, this is really great. Thank you for the session. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, again, um, that really, really great session. Uh, I'm glad everyone was able to tune in and sorry to lose Steve kind of through that, uh, but he was a, a great addition as well. Um, so just to wrap up, you know, I'd like to give a formal thank you to our moderator, Chuck Hawley, and our panelists, Steve Colgate and Karen Prelo and uh, Bruce Brown. And thank you all for joining us um, and the viewers as well who are going to tune in uh, after the fact and watch it at some point later. As promised, any participant on uh, this Cruising World Starboard Portal session to receive a 30% discount on digital copy of the book, Safety at Sea, A Guide to Safety, Under Sail, and Personal Survival, the companion book to our US Sailing Sanctioned Safety at Sea courses. The book uh, normally retails for $25.95 and is a great value for the money. Uh, it's a valuable resource to have on board any cruising sailboat or even any powerboat. So this is for the digital version only. So to uh, activate in your discount, please go to the US Sailing store, which is shop, .ussailing.org and click on digital text. Select the Safety at Sea digital textbook and enter the code CW2020. That's CW2020 as in Cruising World 2020 in the discount code box and uh, at the checkout and hit apply. I've also put a link to it in the chat box with the coupon code as well. So you can just copy and paste and put it right in. Uh, it's a great value for the money, and heck, you can even wrap it up for your favorite crew and place it underneath the holiday tree, virtually, of course. So thanks again for all for tuning in, and if you enjoyed today's session or any of the other sessions we've put on, please support our efforts to build a community of active and engaged sailors through the Starboard Portal by purchasing or renewing a U.S. sailing membership. We have some more great panels and some more leadership forums coming up in the near future, as mentioned, and thanks to U.S. sailing members who are able to continue to adapt and evolve and better serve sailors with content like this. Please visit us at mem.ussailing.org to join or renew your U.S. Sailing membership today. Thanks again. I hope you have a great rest of your Tuesday. Sail safe, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, we're off.